It's 2020 and we're celebrating the new year, thinking of those resolutions for the year to come. However, on the other side of the world, the news isn't so great. There's a new outbreak of an unknown virus in China. In the city of Wuhan, those who are becoming ill seem to have a link to a local fish market. People are becoming seriously ill, and cases continue to rise and spread. The World Health Organization then announces that this is a new coronavirus. The news that no one wanted to hear that the outbreak is a global pandemic. Testing ramps up around the world. Governments provide guidance to the best they can. Travel plans are halted. Despite these measures, more and more people become ill. We see our first case in the bubble of St. Andrews. Then. We will beat the coronavirus, and we will beat it together. And therefore, I urge you, at this moment of national emergency, to stay at home, protect our NHS, and save lives. Thank you. For everyone, you must stay at home unless it is absolutely essential to go out, and that includes working from home wherever possible. Life should not feel normal for you right now, so if it is, then you are not doing the right things, and I want to ask you today to please put that right. I'm an inveterate positive thinker. I believe in positivity. I think it helps you through difficult times. And in a situation like the one in which we've found ourselves, I have felt that positivity and being positive were an incredibly important part of coping with this. Um, and so I have tried to be positive all the way through. Sometimes it's it's been quite challenging to, to do that. But I think uh, deliberately, self-consciously, and even on occasion in a slightly contrived way, adopting a positive frame of mind works for me. And I also think that institutionally, it's my, my duty and my obligation to be as positive, realistically positive, as I, as I can. So for me, the pandemic has in part been uh, a, about finding the best ways to be positive. Um, in terms of things where I felt that um, it's been a positive experience, I would have to start with the fact that I think that we as an institution have responded really well to what has been an extended crisis. You sometimes hear that people work well in a crisis situation, and that tends to refer to um, a couple of days or a week. We've been doing this um, for the best part of, of nine months. And I do think that um, what we've seen is how people respond in an extended crisis, how um, they can prioritise what really matters, um, how you can let compassion come to the fore, but you also um, appreciate, it helps people to appreciate what, in business terms, it's essential to get done. And I think that particular sort of constellation of emotions and ways of seeing has been a very valuable learning experience that we have needed really to explore our humanity. But um, in the senior team that I run and lead, we have also persistently had to take big decisions fast. And we have done so on a kind of consultative and where possible iterative basis. And one of the terrific things for me um, has been that my senior team have just been fantastic all the way through and you couldn't necessarily presume that that would be the case but everybody has pulled their weight we've got on really well we have not fallen out with each other in fact i think we have really strengthened our bonds and our sense of support with each other um so from that perspective um it has been a genuinely and almost kind of surprisingly positive experience 
Um, and I think that you can read that across the university as a whole. I think that, that many people have shown themselves to be adaptable, flexible, incredibly creative, and just determined to get through this for ourselves, our staff and our students in the best possible way. And I, I would extend that right across um, the institution. Um, and I'm not being sentimental about that. You know, not everybody has, has pulled their weight. Um, this is real life. You can't expect that to happen. But the majority of people have done, and they've done so willingly um, and in a very constructive way. Um, so sometimes, you know, disruption can be, uh, can be beneficial in terms of enabling you to see the best in people. The flip side of that is that, of course, it has taken its toll. Um, these have been very hard times for people, and they've been hard in practical terms, but also because many people have been worried and anxious. And we have all felt that. Um, I've had COVID in my immediate household. It's, it's a frightening thing when it, when it happens. And we have lost things. Um, some of us have, have lost loved ones and friends, but we've also lost practical, real things in our daily professional lives. We've lost a normal teaching experience. We've lost graduation. People have lost research leave. We were unable to go ahead because of our financial situation with running promotions. So we have a sense of things that we have lost um, and things that we will not get back from that particular period of time. And um, everybody has experienced that to a lesser or a greater degree, but also I think quite an extended degree. And that, that as I've said, that, that takes its toll on people. So you have to put all that in the, in the balance. And um, I, I imagine we will come on to this, um, but I, I also think, you know, when you put it all in the balance, there comes a point when you have to kind of stand back and also give yourself the time to think, um, what have we lost? What have we learned from this? What can we take away? Um, what can we learn that's valuable in terms of what we might want to keep? And um, what will we actually quite happily set aside? I, I think for me, they will have been as for everybody um, concerns about family, um, not being able to see people. Um, being at a considerable distance from one's family and not being able to engage um, with them in, in the way that one would want to. Um, so that, I think, for me, as for everybody, um, you know, being separated from some of your loved ones is, is hard. Um, and uh, modern technology compensates to some degree. But um, for me, as for other people, if you have, you know, elderly um, family who don't too easily engage with 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 tech, um, then that that becomes just it makes everything harder. So uh, I, I think the continued engagement with family in the way that one would want to engage um, has been a a hardship and a, a difficult thing. Um, I I would say that um, being in one place to the extent that I have been for the past nine months um, has been quite a shock to my system. Um, St Andrews is a wonderful place to spend the majority of nine months, but uh, I think spending so much time in one place is something that I haven't done for probably the past, I don't know, 45 years, something like that. And certainly my, my normal regime as principal is that I'm traveling virtually every week on, in, in some uh, in some times of, of, of the year, and, and not just UK travel, um, but more extended travel, and um, we might come on to the sort of sustainability aspects of, of that. Um, so I've, and the reason for that travel is generally um, to pursue the kind of conversations that need to happen in person. And one thing that lockdown has really brought home to me is that um, digital and online are are great supplements. Um, they're not great substitutes um, for personal, person-to-person -person interaction, particularly of the sort that I quite often need to do in my, my role as, as principal. So I have missed that and been frustrated by it and um, have worried, as I think many other people in my position have done, as to whether it's possible to do your job to the um, 
the fullest degree if you are inhibited from having the sort of sit down in person contacts that are a really important part um, of, of representing the university, um, of engaging with our alumni right across the world and also um, in, in pursuing fundraising and in philanthropy. So, um, so I, I know this is partly a question about sort of outside work, but um, I, for me, it's also a question about, you know, um, how one generally lives one's life. And I live a lot of my life on, on the road. So um, adjusting to that has, has, has been actually quite, quite a challenge. But uh, I also think that when, you know, normal service sort of resumes, um, getting back and getting, as it were, sort of match fit um, will take will take some time because you 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 keep up the sort of regime that I'm normally used to just because it's it's what you do all the time. When you step off that particular treadmill, um, I, I think it becomes harder to get back on it. So I'm I'm sort of quite interested to see um, how I'll take to the resumption of my old life when it becomes possible again. So, so one of my great recreations in, in life um, is reading. Uh, I am just a completely compulsive reader. That's the one thing that I'm absolutely sort of compulsive about. I, I have to read. Reading is, is total therapy for me. Um, I, I share this with Lewis, who, who works for me, and we're always kind of swapping books and talking about our reading experiences. Um, reading is relaxation for me, um, as, as well as just something that I need to do. Um, so it's an abiding love for me. And one of the uh, effects of lockdown um, has been that I have had more time for, for, for reading, even more time than I would normally just determinedly create in, in my life. Uh, one of the few advantages of regularly doing very long plane journeys is that you, know, you can get through a book. Um, so I have found some sort of particular pleasures in, in being able to read more. Um, and, and to read some of the things that have sort of been on my, uh, you know, I want to read or reread. Um, so I, I'll just give you some very quick examples. Um, I reread, I mean, this is not where most people would start, but I'm a, I'm a medievalist. Um, so I reread the whole of a wonderful volume published in 1961, which is Essays on the Scottish Reformation, edited by David McRoberts. Um, because in St Andrews, we have the impact of the Scottish Reformation all around us. And although I'd read those essays over the past 40 years many times, I wanted to sit down and read the whole book, which is very much written from a Catholic perspective. And then I found myself actually corresponding about the book with Father Michael John Galbraith, um, our, our Roman Catholic um, chaplain. And we had a fascinating correspondence about it, which entirely came out of lockdown and would not have happened otherwise. And indeed, um, I'm due to give a uh, a lecture on the Scottish Reformation to the Catholic Society in the new year as, as a result of that dialogue. But what else have I been reading? Uh, I'm a huge fan of Dickens and I just sat down and, and read Barnaby Rudge, um, which I think was the one Dickens novel I had never actually read. Um, and given its, um, its focus on the Gordon riots and the whole kind of Scottish side of that, it was utterly fascinating to me and a total pleasure to read it. I read um, uh, somebody who has an honorary fellowship here, Adam Sisman's um, brilliant biography of Hugh Trevor Roper, um, whom I, I knew latterly in, 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 in his older years, um, towards the end of his life, and I found that biography absolutely fascinating. I have, in a way that I'm afraid sounds very Monty Python, um, been rereading parts of Proust. Um, Proust is just one of my obsessions, I suppose, and um, it, you know it repays um, rereading. So I haven't reread the whole thing, but I've been kind of rereading the bits that that I like. So um, I could go on about this indefinitely, but the the pleasures of of being able um, late in the evening um, to pick up a book. Um, in a more extended way than I've been able to do perhaps over the past four years um, has just has has been an unexpected compensation and one that I think I will find again um, quite hard to to set aside when um, I resume my um, more customary itinerary. Working from home has been a mixed blessing. I think that uh, 
there have been occasions when it's been obviously it's been manifestly necessary but we have many of us have learned how we can work from home and um, how we can build that flexibility into our existence and we've learned the sort of minimal minimum kit that we need working from home as well we've also learned that um, we can do all sorts of things um, uh, via a digital and online means um, where, where we don't need to travel and um, uh, what I would say on this is that I think we as an institution have to learn from this from the sustainability perspective um, what it will mean for me, um, and I know that I'm not representative, um, is that I will be much more circumspect about some aspects of my travel. Um, regularly, pre-COVID, I would be up and down to London two, sometimes three times a, a week um, for really key meetings. Um, I think it's very unlikely that I will do that again, um, certainly not to the same extent. However, what I have learned, um, and I will, uh, I've already indicated to most of the boards that I'm on, that this is the line that I will take on this, is that I think in the future, um, meetings are either with everybody in situ or with everybody online. It does not work to have a mixed economy. And so I think boards are gonna to have to make their minds up about this, that either everybody's down in London for a particular meeting or we're all meeting um, on, online. I don't think you can and should mix it up. It, it creates, it just creates a kind of streaming and a hierarchy that doesn't actually make for the good exchange of ideas and decision making. So I, I know that I will be more circumspect about my travel. Um, I also know, as I've indicated, that it will be necessary for me to do some serious amounts of long haul again when it's possible, because I need to remake um, the in-person connections with um, alumni supporters and donors across the, the globe that um, take the university forward and um, I accept that but I will be very circumspect about how I plan my tra travel and I'm delighted that the Environmental Sustainability Board is working um, with us so effectively in terms of um, how we can most meaningfully engage with carbon offsetting so I think that would be a really important part of how we conduct our business in, in the future. Um, of course, we've all learned a lot about um, what digital enables. And I think that has, has and will opened up our horizons about what sort of digital university we want to be. But I'd say two main things here. One is that the in-person experience at St Andrews remains important um, and um, we have to hang on to that and really reinforce it when we come out of COVID. That in situ in person teaching that, that we deliver is a, a really strong marker of our identity. The other issue in relation to digital is that um, we need to be provocative and ambitious about what sort of university we want to be digitally and the key thing that we want to be able to do is that the quality of whatever digital experience we decide that we want to offer in the future has to match and be of a kindred nature with the in-person experience that we offer. So in the principal's office at the moment, we're giving a great deal of thought to how we can achieve that. And that has very much been um, impelled by the nature of the COVID experience. We've all coped with online, um, but I mean, you know, I had days during lockdown and I'm not proud of this. I had days when I spent literally 10 hours a day sitting in front of my computer doing incredibly urgent meetings. And I had one or two weeks when I didn't actually, not, not quarantine weeks, but weeks when I didn't actually leave the house um, because I was so busy um, sitting in front of a computer doing meetings. And I don't think that was very good for me um, in all sorts of, of ways. Um, but it also absolutely reinforced to me the limitations of this particular medium. Um, it, it, it's functional. It serves a purpose. Um, I, I love the fact that after nine months, we all still don't know most of the time whether we're on, on mute or, or not. Um, and that frankly is because we're sort of punch drunk with this experience. Um, uh, it's easy to say how wonderful um, online has been, that it has enabled us to keep up our, our academic and educational engagement going. Of that, there is no doubt. And it's been essential to us and to our, our business model. I accept that. 
Um, but boy, have we also um, experienced its limitations. Um, we're people, we like in-person contact, most of us. Um, and uh, I've really learned from that. So, and one of the things I've learned from that is it, whatever we do digitally, it needs to be really, really good quality. For me, it's very simple, actually. And I, I think I, I, I suddenly remembered this about a month into lockdown. And it's one of the virtues of being a medievalist. There is a, a wonderful um, Anglo-Saxon, short Anglo-Saxon poem um, called Deor, which is the um, uh, the name of the person who is um, producing these reflections. And it's a short poem. It's in a, a manuscript which is known as a 10th century manuscript, um, one of the great manuscripts, one of the great codices of Anglo-Saxon poetry, known as the Exeter Book in Exeter Cathedral. And this is a short poem with a refrain at the end of each stanza, and it reflects on about five monumental, tragic, um, mythical events um, known to have happened in um, Anglo-Saxon stroke Nordic culture. Big cataclysmic events which um, have massive implications for um, groups of people. And Deor um, is reflecting on these events, which are very shortly encapsulated because the audience for whom the poem was written would have instantly understood what was being referred to. And um, at the end of the account of short account of each of these events, the narrative voice um, comments, Thus offer Eoda, thesis swa mai which would translate into modern English as that past, so can this. And it's a very sort of stoical, philosophical way of reflecting on something terrible happening that essentially the wise person knows you have to endure because it will end. And uh, I have found myself thinking about that um, a lot during the current crisis. Um, that past, so can this. Um, things do pass, you get through them and you come out the other side. And you come out different, we all will come out differently from this. Um, but I find that consoling, I, in the way that I think one sometimes can only find literature consoling. I find Dale's reflections over a millennium later extremely consoling and offering of the kind of perspective that I think we've all needed over the past nine months and I have to say we'll probably need over the next year as well. <laughs>